this. So uh, welcome everyone and thank you for taking this time out to be here. I know it's, uh, time is precious in, these, in this kind of work and so uh, thanks for taking the time to be here today and to those joining us online. Um, let's see. So uh, I want to first of all thank the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience here at Coventry University and the People's Food Policy for also uh, being co-sponsors of this. And a few more thank yous to say. Um, a lot of my work that I will speak to comes out of two projects. One, the acronym for this thing is SUFFICE, Community First, Impacts of Community Engagement. I will probably talk about it a little more later on. Well, in fact, I'll tell you a little bit about it now. It is a research project looking at how to maximize the value for nonprofit community sector partners as they uh, collaborate with uh, post-secondary institutions in research and in teaching and so on and really trying to understand how do you reduce those transaction costs how do you make sure that these partnerships are really a benefit to community partners and uh, in that work um, when I started with it back in 2012 uh, I my community partner was an organization called Food Secure Canada which is the national umbrella organization for a whole bunch of grassroots organizations in Canada working to build sustainable food systems, achieve zero hunger, and uh, have safe food. Uh, <clears throat> the other project, uh, also a government-funded project in Canada, is called FLEDGE, also an acronym for Food Locally Embedded, Globally Engaged, is a research project that uh, uh, has partners around the world and certainly across Canada working on building sustainable food systems, also in a very partnership way with a lot of uh, local food actors and in fact Food Secure Canada is again one of our partners in that project so um, and this will become clear as we go along that my relationship with Food Secure Canada has, has been on multiple levels over the last uh, 10 or more years. Um, I also just want to thank uh, Mary Coolis, who's currently a PhD candidate with me. Um, I, in fact, I stole some of her slides for this talk, and she's the one that put all the nice pictures up. Um, she is working as a research assistant tracking the national food policy process in Canada, and in fact is hoping to do a comparative study with the UK's effort to have a food policy uh, from around 2009 to 2011. Um, and so if anybody here knows about that experience, uh, I'd love to uh, hear more. I promised her I'd bring her some intelligence back on that question. Um, <clears throat> and my colleague uh, Patricia Balamingi in Geography and Environmental Studies at Carleton. I do a lot of work on food policy with her. Um, so my plan today is just to tell you a bit about myself, um, just to give you some context for some of what I'm going to say afterwards. Um, briefly explore what food sovereignty has come to mean in the Canadian context and how mobilization has happened around food sovereignty, uh, specifically through the People's Food Policy Project from 20, 2007 to 2011. Welcome. Um, uh, briefly give you some political economic context. I don't know if that's actually all that necessary, but uh, and then talk, tell you about the last six months or so because things have been moving very rapidly in this area of food policy and I'll share a bit about what's been happening and um, some of how I with some of our food movement partners have engaged in the process particularly around trying to give some governance recommendations to a national food policy um, and uh, I may or may not get I'd, I've done this whole with Mary a whole historical piece of research looking at previous efforts to kind of move food policy forward in Canada, so I could get into some of that, but we'll see. Um, <clears throat> and as part of that, we've also been doing sort of an international scan, so we'll see how much of that we get into. Um, and at the very end, I will ask the question that we, I ask off the top, which is, is this food sovereignty? Um, because as civil society and food movements who have developed quite a strong sense of who they are and the kind of food systems that they believe are just and sustainable um, engage with other actors across the food system to influence national policy there's all kinds of levels at which compromise is either forced upon them or at which they have to change how they frame their work how they talk about their work just to get in the door and be heard right and that's um, you know th those conundrums are beneath the surface and a lot of what I'll, I'll talk about today and and I think deserves some conversation, which we'll do some of that with the camera on and then hopefully some of that with the camera off. 
Uh, <clears throat> so just to give you some context on myself, I've been working in food systems uh, really since uh, 1992. I organized a community garden. I was the coordinator of a community garden in the city that I was living in just as I finished my undergraduate degree in uh, environmental sciences. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was sort of an organic garden meant to be a teaching space and we brought our food to the local food bank and sort of, so, uh, so that's what, 25 years of involvement in food in different ways, food, food systems. Um, my PhD work was looking at the international uh, debate over the regulations of genetically modified organisms. Uh, specifically, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety was my case study, so that was really a project in international relations and international political economy. Um, after that, I got, kind of got tired of the suits, and so for my postdoctoral work, I went to Australia, and I had a great project going around to uh, alternative, uh, uh, well, essentially looking at short food supply chains in, that were emerging in the Australian context. And so that's what this photo is of me checking out this little free range chicken farm and having conversations with the farmers there. Um, <clears throat> since then, I've also done a lot of work in community food security. And this picture is from a project called Hope Blooms in uh, Nova Scotia, where I've worked with a lot of local actors around, um, uh, well, in introducing kids to healthy food and to growing their own food. And in this case, these kids make their own salad dressings, which they sell at the farmer's market as part of fundraising to kind of uh, uh, get activities in their school and whatever. So very sort of bottom up kind of um, uh, initiatives to get kids excited about food and then also economic development through that. Uh, and then the People's Food Policy Project, I'll mention, uh, I've Yes, I've had, I was involved in the process in various ways, but always as really as an academic, supporting some of the writing around the work that was happening in the late 2000s. Uh, I worked very closely for probably about five years with Kathleen Neen, who was the kind of the main architect really of the People's Food Policy Project in Canada uh, with a number of other people. She went to the Nealani conference in uh, Mali in 2007 and came home and said we should do something about food sovereignty in Canada. And um, so I worked with her in various ways, even before the project started and then supporting it as I went along, often with students. So I had a, st a, a master's student, also Sarah Martin, um, uh, became a recorder at a lot of the meetings of the animators of the People's Food Policy Project and uh, ended up writing her thesis about that experience. Um, so, and then I continued to be involved. The People's Food Policy Project kind of fed into, originally it wasn't led by Food Secure Canada, but it became sort of their, their anchoring uh, policy document, as if, if you will, as this national uh, umbrella organization really kind of came together and was able to get some foundation funding to move its agenda forward. Um, I gather that many of you in this context know about the food sovereignty movement in La Via Campesina, so I won't say much about it, other than to say that if you follow these folks at all, you know that their definitions are often changing from every couple of years, or slight variations, because it's a very dynamic, active social movement uh, with uh, very grounded in, in pr the practice of food sovereignty, um, a bit of an arm's length relationship with both NGOs and uh, uh, academics often because they really sort of want to drive their own agenda and I, th I admire them for that because it's uh, it's tough work in the world today to hold on to your values and I really see in many ways they are doing that and and clarifying their values you know a, a number of years ago they kind of came to the realization that in order to have healthy and appropriate food through ecologically sound and sustainable methods you need to address gender inequality in the food system and, and not only in the food system. And so, you know, those, that kind of work, I think, has been intellectual work happening in the movement, I think, has been really important. Um, when people like Kathleen, and there were several others after they went to Mali and then came back to Canada, that's in, in Mali, the La Via Campesina met up with some of the other allied organizations are interested in food sovereignty and said, let's define pillars of food sovereignty. And you may recognize these. Um, 
Uh, and what happened in Canada is then a, a core group of people came together and they had some funding from a couple of foundations to say, what does food sovereignty mean in the Canadian context? Let's stimulate a national conversation, not, around, not only around what does food sovereignty mean to us, how do we practice food sovereignty and live food sovereignty, but um, how uh, and what would it look like to try and influence government policy from the food sovereignty lens. Um, and uh, I always loved, they, they had a series of six uh, little handouts. Uh, this was around 2008 and the, the localizing food system handout was the, the breastfeeding child, which is about as, as local as it gets, right? Um, from the beginning, La Via Campesina has always been uh, a north-south kind of alliance, right? Between organizations in the global north and in the global south. And from the beginning had Canadians as part of it as well. The National Farmers Union, um, Union Paysanne in Quebec have been there from the beginning. And uh, it's been interesting, we could talk about it, but about how the, the global conversation has really influenced the National Farmers Union perspective on things like free trade and so on over the, uh, the decades. Um, initially, they were core parts of La Via Campesina, um, and as food sovereignty conversations spread in Canada, the other quickly to come on board were some of the NGOs that do sort of international development work and were, had encountered the food sovereignty discourse overseas and, and were comfortable with it. Um, uh, urban food security organizations were less familiar with it, and I'll tell you about that in a second. And so this was a newer concept to them in the late, two, uh, late first part of the first decade of the century. Um, indigenous organizations in Canada were less familiar with the framing as well, though quickly grappled on because they have their own sort of sovereign territorial sovereignty claims, and so it made sense very quickly. I mean, what I haven't mentioned here in Quebec, in Quebec is also we have a, a, a sovereignty movement of the province of Quebec long-standing, and so food sovereignty in the Quebec context has been, I would say, appropriated in interesting ways by the um, uh, large uh, farmers unions and so on as they have articulated their concerns through the language of food sovereignty. Um, the six Nealini pillars, when the conversation really got going in Canada, uh, very quickly indigenous people informed the conversation and this idea of the seventh pillar of food sovereignty became really important to uh, the People's Food Policy Project document that was eventually produced. In fact, the whole opening chapter is about what does food sovereignty mean in the Indigenous context in Canada, and they felt it was important to add a seventh pillar of the idea that food is sacred. Um, and uh, this image on the, on the right is, uh, comes out of the Suffice Research Project that I mentioned. We did work with Indigenous uh, communities on the west coast of Canada uh, about community campus partnerships and uh, one of the instructions we got in one of those communities is whenever you give slideshows about your work with us, we need this message to get out. At the time it was about oil pipelines and about the threat that oil pipelines presented to their culture, not just to their seafood, but to their culture. Um, and so, but I, I have this slide here just to show how in the Canadian context, y yeah, you really have to be aware of the indigenous land that we're on, that we're working on, the indigenous communities that have often been pushed off of good agricultural land to allow for colonial farming settlements and it's an important part of the conversation about what, what does decolonizing mean in that context? Who gets access to the land and for what purposes? And those kind of questions are very central. Um, I'm not going to tell you much about this. You can find the journal article. This came out of Sarah Martin's work that I mentioned earlier where uh, she spent you know, we were intrigued by here's food sovereignty as this uh, lens that's informing a national conversation around food and food policy. What does that mean to the activists and the movements that are embracing the concept? And what we found is that, in fact, there was no united movement. I mean, I suppose every movement has its divisions, right? And within the food sovereignty movement in Canada, through her work, really with a governmentality lens, we started seeing how different activists uh, mobilized food sovereignty in very different ways. Um, those who were, came from a farming background and an indigenous background in particular, it was about something they lived and worked and knew with their hands. And then it was about translating that into you know, appropriate policies to allow that work of food sovereignty, the daily work of food sovereignty to exist. 
whereas in particular for the sort of um, the you know in the period of neoliberalization the there's been a massive uh, growth in sort of urban food security organizations or whatever there's a whole you know second public safety net the 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 third sector public safety net that these organizations represent and many of those urban activists were interested in food sovereignty intrigued by it this is around 2009 wanting to kind of uh, connect with it but didn't feel it in the, in their under their fingernails in the same way you know so they talked about it in different ways and we sort of explored you know the lingo sounds like a grad class was one of the comments she picked up and uh, we were we've explored in this article really uh, uh, what are the implications for this seeming united movement that has you know uh, dissonance beneath the surface in any case uh, I'm not going to say much about the political economic context other than to say that Canada is the fourth largest exporter of food in the world, right? So, uh, and if you talk about uh, the dumping of agricultural surplus in the global south, particularly countries like Africa and what it means for the, the um, preventing local food systems from really grabbing hold, uh, you know, Canada has a, a a big role in that, um, along with the U.S. and um, and that's one thing to say. The other thing is that there's a history in in Canada of tension. You know, you might talk about sort of in terms of Polanyi's double movement between sort of liberalization of markets and then the sort of the re-embedding of markets in structures that are meant to be more redistribute redistributive. And uh, so back in the uh, 1920s, uh, the co-op movement on the prairies is a way for farmers to kind of gain some political power in the face of the railway uh, control of very few railway companies to eventually d supply management systems in dairy, which continue to this day, which protect dairy farmers in relation to uh, and basically allow fairly small dairy farms to survive against the American massive American uh, dairy farms, uh, Canadian wheat board structure, which was eliminated by our last government, um, but also was a single desk seller for Canadian wheat in international markets meant to sort of support uh, farmers. So yeah, certainly from the, from the agricultural political economy context, there's this uh, tension between those kind of protective measures, which we had particularly up until say the 1960s, new initiatives to do that and then since then it's really been the gradual erosion of a lot of those those mechanisms um, uh, so now I'm going to bring you so that so the people's food policy project um, led to uh, essentially they had uh, animators across the country essentially food activists who said I want to host conversations in my community hall at my church in my my kitchen table and say what kind of a food system do we want for this country? What are the problems with it? What do we want to see changed? Um, 3,500 such conversations happened across the country. And then through a couple of conferences, they kind of, and, and pulling together drafting, uh, draft chapters of the, in the, which eventually all fed into a sort of a, a big document called the People's Food Policy. Released, um, I had a picture of it back there, uh, in the 2011, election. There was a suddenly an election and, and the timing was right to kind of put it on the table and have it be taken seriously by governments. Um, the other thing that happened just a year later, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, some of you may know Olivier de Scooter, uh, came to Canada on the invitation, officially on the invitation of the Canadian government, but really on the invitation of Canadian NGOs to say, you know, can you kind of host a high, some high level discussion about what's going on in our food system. Very high levels of food insecurity, particularly in the north, particularly with indigenous communities. Um, uh, you know, farmers not making a living. I think you're, you're familiar of the litany of kind of uh, challenges associated with working within the dominant food system. Some people do very well, thank you very much. And then there's a whole bunch of people working on the margins and excluded from that system. And his report really brought that to light and was I think an important moment for the food movement in Canada on a number of levels, bringing the human rights conversation and the right to food conversation in with, uh, to connect it with the food security and, and uh, food sovereignty discourses that were already there, and really to, um, to yeah, bring the conversation to a high level. 
Um, and that was one of, so this is where I'm going to talk about the, the current process to build a national food policy in Canada didn't just come from the People's Food Policy Project. I would say that it was pivotal in the sense that a lot of the other documents that have come along in the last 10 years were in many ways a response to, okay, social movements are agitating for change and they're getting more sophisticated in the message that they have to share to our government. So we had the, um, the Conference Board of Canada, which is sort of a big industry group, uh, come out with their food policy statements um, in 2014. Uh, Canadian Federation of Agriculture, I think it was around 2009 that their food strategy document came out, basically a response to the people's food policy saying, well, this is what a national food policy would mean for farmers. Um, these are folks who are really interested in sort of Canada in, the, in international markets. And so sort of that side of the business and agriculture sphere came in. Uh, Inuit Tapirit uh, Kanatami is the national organization for uh, the Inuit of Canada's Arctic regions um, and have come forward with policy statements. Um, and then Food Secure Canada during this whole time I, I would say was going through a, a process of uh, professionalizing as social movements, you know, as they mature, you know, and there's tensions around that too because they're increasingly talking with, gov with government representatives on a first name basis but then there's, there's sometimes their grassroots membership is saying, you know, what are you doing about, why are you doing that, and what about, you know, the movement building that you really should be focusing on. Then 2015, November 2015, we had an election in Canada and uh, got uh, this guy who apparently is quite popular overseas, I'm learning about, uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, came in, uh, quite a breath of fresh air really, given that we had uh, 10 years of a conservative government. And, uh, and Food Secure Canada was very strategic during the election. They hosted, they, they encouraged people to meet with your MP, host conversations again around what the federal government can be doing around food policy. Uh, I have the numbers somewhere, but something like uh, 30 members of the Liberal Caucus that came to Ottawa had been to one of those events. Um, many more from other parties as well, but certainly even from the Liberal Caucus, including four or five people who are now in the cabinet, had been to one of these kind of socialization events to learn about the, the, the food policy views of Food Secure Canada and its members. Um, and so this was the letter that he put in his, uh, this, the statement that he put in his letter to Lawrence McCauley. Uh, farmer who became the Minister of Agriculture and he's been there since uh, 2015. Um, and this is basically the th the, the, what develop a food policy, you know, and then you can wonder about the language, promotes healthy living and safe food by putting more healthy high quality food produced by Canadian ranchers and farmers on the table of families across the country. Um, and uh, interestingly one of the challenges with the food policy process in Canada is that he was the only minister to get this remit. And so, th for the next year, we basically heard nothing. And the, we, being on the outside of government, heard nothing. And it was because folks in the Ministry, ministry of Agriculture, seeing this in his mandate letter, basically, and they follow those letters pretty strictly, um, organized a department and said, okay, we've got to uh, figure out who among our cabinet colleagues, who among our departments and agencies, we need to have part of this conversation about building a national food policy. Turns out there were 16 different departments and agencies at that table, you know, from trade and fisheries and health and public health and, and so on. Uh, and only one of them had this in their mandate letter. And so, you know, I'll come back to this because a lot of power continues to rest with the Department of Agriculture, who historically has really been about building export markets for Canadian food products and not necessarily about paying attention to what Canadians are eating, how healthy that is, whether it's locally produced and so on, right? Um, now the, and, and as part of the end of this story, the, the, we recently had a, a, a Minister of Health turnover and a new mandate letter was written for a new Minister of Health just about two months ago. And uh, that new mandate letter does say you have to work on a national food policy. So it's interesting how, you know, the government is taking it seriously and it's, and it's having these impacts internally. So now I'm just going to quickly show you a few, the slide deck from uh, Greg Meredith, who was the as, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister uh, a, a little over a year ago. Um, there's another one that's working on this file now. Um, to give you a sense of what the Canadian government, how they frame food policy. 
Um, and one of the first things right off the top is uh, they name the resetting the table document as sort of one of the key documents that they're looking to as they think or try to understand what do Canadians want. Alongside the, the strategy from, this is the Conference Board of Canada strategy, this is the, uh, the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute, and that's the Federation of Agriculture. So they were sort of seen as the four horsemen for a national food policy. Um, I apologize that these are kind of grainy because essentially I just cut and paste his slides into my slides to just give you a sense. Uh, interestingly, they're also looking to models outside of Canada and if any of you know of the Scotland food and drink policy in Ireland, you're, if you know about these things, you're probably already starting to think, what does that have to do with food sovereignty? <laughs> That's about developing export markets and niche markets for, you know, selling Scottish, uh, you know, made products around the world and into European markets and whatever. So, you know, what does this have to do with some of these core tenets? Although in each of these national, in most of these other national models, there is some attention to questions of food security and whatever, but probably in quite a different way from what the, the food movements would be saying. Um, this is interesting. Uh, this is the framing the federal government wants to achieve these sort of four big areas. And this is what they went into national consultations with this past summer. Um, I went to the, the National Food Summit in June. Uh, along with um, many colleagues from the Canadian Association for Food Studies. It was interesting, they came and announced the whole public consultation process at the Academic Association meeting in May. A surprise announcement. Um, and a whole bunch of academics came up afterward and say, well, I want to be part of the consultation. And in fact, uh, you know, this is where you, you, I'm almost going to start sounding like a spokesperson for my government, which I am not. but. Uh, Everybody who asked to be invited to that national consultation from the, ac from the academic associations connected to food was, was invited and paid for by the government to go to either the national meeting or one of the regional meetings that happened across the country. Um, and so this is the slightly hopeful part of my, my talk because uh, these were the, the framings that the government started with and they, they continue to have all four in the picture. Um, you can imagine that there's tensions between the aspirations around what does sustainable growth of the agriculture and food sector look like as it, as it is known as the mainstream industry, you know, and, and are there tensions with environment and health, for example, and even with food security? Um, many movement act activists would say yes. Uh, many industry folks would agree, although not to the, in this exactly the same ways. Um, the, what I've seen of this consultation, I recently heard uh, the new director of the department under the person who's replaced Greg Meredith give a presentation on where they're at with this. And uh, you see things like protecting and improving the quality of water, soil, and air. Um, well, for better or worse, that they've now added the word biodiversity in there as one of the things that needs to be protected. Um, coming out of this consultation process. For a while, they had in their aims around food security, they, they used the word affordable to say we want Canadians to have access to affordable food. And they heard a lot from the food movement that the question isn't about affordability. If on the food security side, it really needs to be about income security. And that message, they've heard that message and they're trying to internalize it as they think about what does that mean for our policies, federal government policies related to food. Uh, so I'm... Uh, cautiously optimistic that the consultation process um, uh, that, they, that they were hearing and, and have been taking this stuff in. We'll, we'll get to some of the other issues later. Um, also important, again, this is one of Greg Meredith's slide, is the idea that they want to see more collaboration and coordination, including a more integrated approach to economic, social, and environmental challenges in the food system. You know, and I think all of you are, you know, probably come with a bit of a food systems or a systems lens and say yes, like the key challenge, whether it's with health policy or food policy or whatever, is the lack of integration, the lack of seeing how things are connected and, and working across them, right? Uh, it's encouraging that our government sees the value of this. So, um, these are the kind of things that they put up at the very beginning, a year ago, about the potential principles for national food policy, promoting horizontal collaboration and coordination within the federal government, working collaboratively with industry, civil society, stakeholders, and Canadians. 
being a federal framework that prevents, prospects provincial and territorial government jurisdiction. This is a, a, an important issue in Canada. We're a federation and we have uh, 13 provinces and territories that each do their own things and, uh, and I will get back to that as well. Um, so now I'm going to, to move forward. Uh, this was June of this year, and it's a slide. I'm, I'm now sort of putting a slide of myself <laughs> giving a presentation to the federal government on uh, a joined up food policy governance, a Canadian model. And this came out of conversations that started just a little before the national consultation in June, where a number of the stakeholders, the, the four horsemen, if you will, realize that if we can't come to some common understanding of what a food policy could achieve and, and how this thing can build over time to be an effective policy, then the government is not going to do it for us. And so, and so this has been an interesting part of this dynamic where government says we're going to develop a policy and then that the, the stakeholders who have historically been on opposite sides of the table go, okay, and if we can start talking to each other, we can maybe get something that's useful for us collectively. Um, there's a big, there's a bunch of gambits in that, right? Uh, so just to give you a sense of the, this was the presentation I gave in June and these are the contributors to a, a document that I was a presenter on, but it was a collaborative document that included unions, uh, foundations, Produce Marketing Association, Organic Trade Association, Maple Leaf is a, is a large, you know, maker of hot dogs and they've gotten into the <laughs> food security business with their center on food security. Um, and, the, and the mainstream agricultural uh, organizations and then a collection of academics at the bottom and research assistants and we worked on this project over the summer. Um, these, this is how I framed it that particular day about what some of the challenges are in developing a national food policy that's meant to be integrative and some of the principles that we might look to uh, to develop a governance mechanism that will, or governance mechanisms to ensure that these challenges are addressed with, the, the, the sort of the, the complexity of the system, system, the multiple levels of decision making, uh, the need for transparency and, and I've been doing a lot of reading on ideas of co-governance lately and tried to put lots of those ideas into uh, this document. Um, our collective recommendations, I, there are more slides that go into the details, but I'm not going to go into them now, but were uh, to that we need a federal interdepartmental committee that has, that has, carries the food policy file and make sure that health and trade and environment and uh, agriculture and so on are coordinating at the very top level, at this deputy minister level within the government. Um, that we, we have not seen, and this is the biggest, one of the biggest red flags I see in the Canadian food policy discussions to date, is the federal government has not brought the provincial governments into the dialogue, even though they have a lot of responsibility for sort of social welfare rates, for even some agricultural policies, uh, health care spending, you know, is generally it comes from the federal government and it's divided up by the provinces, and so uh, a lot of the food related files are at the provincial level and yet the provinces haven't really been in this discussion. Um, in Canada right now, you, there's a lot of discussion about how to work with indi Canada's indigenous peoples and increasingly individual nations or groups of nations want to be dealt with on a nation to nation basis with the federal government. So that was part of our recommendations and in the north it's known as Inuit to Crown relations. Um, we were proposing the idea of a, an annual food policy meeting, not unlike uh, th what Brazil does in relation to its uh, food and nutrition policies as a sort of an annual forum or a biannual forum for bringing together a lot of the social movements active on food and nutrition. Uh, and the key recommendation, uh, and, and this is a, a something we're floating and it seems to be sticking so far, is the idea of a National Food Policy Council as a multi-stakeholder body that would have um, provide ongoing advisory capacity and problem solving capacity to uh, the federal government. And so this is where, you know, I'm a, I come out of um, sort of environmental policy, environmental politics and have a, uh, uh, 
am, I'm always encouraged by the idea of sort of deliberative democratic processes as a way of, of ensuring sort of real meaningful dialogue between key stakeholders and as, as ways to find new solutions that were not there before from the individual perspectives around the table. Um, and this, as you may know, Canada has been a real leader at the municipal food policy council level. Uh, the model developed in, I think it originally came from the states, but it was, but Canada, but Toronto is the longest serving food policy council since 1991. Very effective mechanism at the municipal level in a big city of whatever, 10 plus million, to uh, develop strategic, uh, um, uh, like they have a whole urban, uh, urban agriculture uh, strategy for the city of Toronto that was developed through the Food Policy Council. They changed all of their uh, zoning bylaws and whatever around street food to make that to allow for more interesting street foods. And they've they've uh, gotten food into the schools and into school programs and done a lot of sort of really interesting work at the intersection between local business, local nonprofits, and local government. Um, and so the, the idea, some U.S. state governments have developed food policy councils at the state level and uh, with some success, uh, Ohio comes to mind, Michigan. And so we are uh, proposing that this is a model that can be used at the federal level. As a, and I think all of us who are part of this process go, wait a second, so the government in May announced they want to have a national food policy and their plan is to release a document that says what their policy is going to be in the first six months of 2018. Um, and those of us who have worked in food issues over the years know that there's so many tensions and incommensurabilities in this system that you're not going to solve it all over that eight month window, right? And come out with, we have the answers to all of these big challenges. So the, the, the idea is, can we create this sort of ongoing advisory structure uh, that allows, for example, on an issue like food waste, that it really brings the industry minds and academic minds and civil society minds and together to work on these issues. Um, and these are some of the, the mandate that we've proposed, uh, including eventually the idea that it could even uh, have some funding capacity to fund projects within various sectors and ag groups and whatever to meet the goals of a national food policy to help kind of bring uh, alignment. Because the biggest challenge, you know, maybe this is, I'm just taking this for granted, the biggest challenge is even if you develop a set of national principles and goals, is how do you get alignment across all these different sectors and governments and movements in the Canadian context? Uh, Right, and so this is the, the idea of s that, that a food policy council would also have to be coordinated with these other uh, mechanisms that I mentioned. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about this because this is the less, uh, so if there was some optimism <laughs> and some excitement about here's like, because uh, just last week I got a letter back, well not me, uh, the I gave the presentation back in June. We had, it was interesting because we had people from the Canola Council there and from the, uh, you know, some of the big industry groups who currently have the ear of government and feel a bit threatened by a proposal that would broaden the conversation to include a much wider range of voices on how food and agriculture and fisheries and so on should be governed in Canada. Um, and, but slowly they are coming along into this conversation. We have deep enough connections with the right industry people to talk to those industry people to say, you know, this is, you know, you have to realize that food isn't just about you. <laughs> it's about a more integrated conversation. And uh, so there will be, I think at this point it's scheduled for early January where we'll go public with this proposal. So far it's really been sort of building the pieces across the sectors internally. Um, and, but we did s formally submit it to the government and CC'd all the other, you know, ministers. Um, the, and just got a letter back uh, last week that from the minister's office that he's read and is keen on, and you know, we've, we've, we've got a, enough positive feedback from government that we know that it's landing and that they know that, that ongoing governance is a question that, that they've had to think about and so they've been welcoming these recommendations. Um, so now this is the part where I get uh, a little more cynical because Canada has been here before. 1977 we developed a food strategy for Canada. 
Um, I'm not going to get into like all of the history and everything. Only thing, the most important <laughs> message is it was axed in 1981, <laughs> replaced by an agri-food growth strategy that that sort of just ignored all of the because 1977 food prices in 1975. 72 to 75 rose by about 50 percent. So there was the oil shock, there were all kinds of international factors, the Russian uh, grain collapse. Um, and uh, so there was a, this public response saying we've got a problem in our food system. And that led to civil society mobilization. And in fact, the precursor to People's Food Policy Project was something called the People's Food Commission in 1978. So in a way, we've been, <laughs> we've been down this path in Canada before developed a national food strategy for Canada that was effectively ineffective and really didn't do anything. Uh, 1998, uh, a more progressive document, Canada's Action Plan for Food Security. Uh, very interesting document, much more consultative process than the original food strategy. Um, limited industry engagement in provinces and territories, and because of that, also nothing really happened. Um, Maybe that's all I'll say about that. Um, so this is, this is part of a paper that we're publishing as part of a special issue of Canadian Food Studies on the national food policy that I'm the editors of with a couple of colleagues. And uh, a whole series of papers meant to inform the national food policy in Canada. And infor unfortunately, ours is uh, a little sad because we looked at the historical documents and said, you know, not actually much has happened. But I think some things have changed. Um, and it's partly these conversations that are happening across civil society, industry, with the right levels of government, not all the right levels of government, certainly federal government. Um, this history of mobilization, the history of food policy councils as effective mechanisms at other levels of governance. So there's sort of been a maturing of the conversation through all of this. In fact, Food Secure Canada, in our analysis, uh, came out of the Action Plan for Food Security of 1997 like the sort of in the eight years afterwards, the NGOs that had coalesced to inform that process were key actors in eventually forming this national umbrella organization. So you can see how these things, you know, build. And so the hope is uh, that it can be a difference this time. In this particular paper, we argue, this is with Mary and Trish, uh, that what we really need in Canada is a pan-Canadian food strategy, not just a national level document. We need the provinces actively helping to negotiate and implement these agreements. Uh, we, the, the national food strategy from 77 had some vague commitments about reducing, you know, eliminating food secure, insecurity and things like that. And it's like, well, it needs to have uh, greater targets and accountability than that. This is the big uh, ongoing concern that I have, though, is the, this, this process has remained led by the Department of Agriculture, which will not, the minister seems to be keen on a national food policy, but all of the other branches within his department will feel like it's a potential risk or it's, it's, it's at odds. It can be at odds with some of their mandates. And, um, and that, may, that was what happened in the previous efforts is that essentially the, the broader food policy conversation was derailed by a, a, a you know, an agri-food export policy conversation, and that uh, is frankly still the risk today. Um, so, I'm not, I, I, yeah, I won't get into the international president, precedence right now. Um, so, I, the question that I have sort of at a, um, no, I guess the point that I want to make is, um, is what is going on right now between Canada's food movements working with these other actors to shape a national food policy and that's and where we seem to be having a fair amount of traction and some chance for impact on this initial strategy document and maybe a governance model is this food sovereignty as and my answer would be like from the food movement's perspective no that there are many many things that priorities that have sort of been left behind. And frankly, one of the, the, the ones that I can tell you very directly, we early in some of our government's documents used the language of the right to food. And uh, it, was, it was contentious. 
and we pulled it back for the sake of keeping the sort of the multi-stakeholder process going forward. Um, I just want to grab a book that I've been reading as sort of as we end this. Um, very good book, just came out recently from EarthScan, Public Policies for Food Sovereignty. Uh, and I, I know Annette Desmarais well, I'm sure Colin does too. And, uh, sh you know, I, it, it's, it, when, I, when I ask this question, I think she would be in the no camp and say, you know, in terms of her work with La Via Campesina over the years, you know, there's a lot being, uh, potentially being compromised here. Uh, and yet, I wrote to Annette and asked her for a letter of support because we had a bunch of sort of high-ranking or sort of uh, highly visible academics across the country as well as industry organizations and CSOs and whatever that we invited to write letters of support around the governance model proposal. And she wrote a letter of support. You know, and I think it's because uh, people who are closely allied with the food sovereignty movement also know that when you start getting close to the corridors of power, the, you know, you, you have to make your choices, right? And in this case, uh, we're choosing with the movement to say, look, having a voice at these federal policy tables where, where basically none has existed before from these movements is going to be a step forward. It's an increasing democratization, if not achieving all of our aims. Um, yeah, and I was reading, uh, anyways, maybe I won't read this, but... Good, good book, and I just I picked it up on the train this morning, and I thought it, you know it deals with a lot of these same conundrums because this is about you know efforts to bring the right to food into constitutions in Latin America, efforts to to work uh, to affect uh, you know health and safety policy in the U.S. and in Europe and whatever, and in, in all of those efforts, when you bring the food sovereignty conversation to the level of the state and start working with state actors, there's 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 wins and there's losses, right? And I think that's that's what we're sitting in right now. So is this food sovereignty as La Via Campesina would have it? I think not. Is this food sovereignty in terms of increasing democ democratic control over food systems? I think there's an opportunity here, which is why, you know, I'm in the maybe camp that's been actively working to move it forward and trying to be hopeful. Um, I'll leave it there. <laughs>